I was there when the Tanner became a serial killer. This is the moment when everything changed for the Tanner or the taxidermist. We didn't call him the taxidermist. We called him the Tanner, the man who tans hides. This is the point where hell opened, the floodgates opened, and the demons rushed in, and he realized that all the skills that he'd developed as a tanner someone who trapped, shot, and skinned animals could now be used on the ultimate prey, human prey. This is also the day when my father's West Virginia gang was formed and fell into place. My father took me to the Tanner's house right after he shot the young man from deer hunting. A quick summary uh, of leading up to this point. My father took me deer hunting. Uh, he told me this and I thought it would be fun and I was like, yeah, great. I'm going to get to spend time with my father. We're going to go hunting. We're going to walk around in the woods. But his only purpose was to murder me. And so he began by starving me for 24 hours. No food, no water. He stripped me naked in my room in the middle of winter. Hunting season doesn't start until December. Okay, and I lived in the north. I lived in Gaithersburg, Maryland. He took everything out of my room, all of my clothes, even the sheets off my bed, so that there was nothing for me to cover myself. And then they turned down the heat so that I was really freezing. Uh, then they brought in the neighbor boys. They called all the neighbor boys. And these are the boys that I grew up with. Six boys pushed their way into my tiny little room. My room was eight by six, very small, just enough to walk to and from the bed. Uh, the L brothers and the M brothers and uh, Gigi Tresan and my father uh, and the dog. Uh, there wasn't enough room for everybody to stand in my room with me. And right before they uh, brought them in the room, my mother had given me a towel. Oh, great kindness that that is. And right before they brought them into the room, my, my father, he ripped the towel away from me uh, with a big grin on his face. Uh, and evil people, when they're doing these things, they always look like they're just having the best time of their life. They always have glee on their face. Anytime you re meet a murderer or a child molester or a thief, they just act like they're having the best time, just the time of their life. So the six boys and uh, Gigi Trezon came into my room, and my father was like, put your hand on him. He came into the room, and he put their hands on my naked body. I'm completely naked. And Gigi Trezon, she's my age. I'm 12 years old. I'm like 70 pounds. And she goes straight for my junk. She's the only girl in the room. She goes straight for my junk and grabs it in her hand. And the moment she did that, and one of the boys, the M boys, they started whooping like wild Indians. Uh, and the the uh, the L brothers, they were started laughing. Well, I just, I had to get them off of me. I, st I punched everybody in the room, some of them three, four times. I didn't punch Gigi, because you're not allowed to hit girls. And But sh they acted like I punched her. Uh, they acted like I did something to her. I didn't, I didn't touch her, because you're not allowed to touch a woman. I never hit her. But then my father came in with his gun and his knife and the dog, and, and this is the family dog. I want you to understand the psychological damage that's going on here. This is our family dog, lives in the house with me, and the dog is bigger than me and attacking me with vicious teeth. And this is my father, this is my father, okay? And he's got a gun and a knife. And so I, I punched him up until he was bloody. Why? Because if you don't fight these people, you're dead. I'm the only person who ever survived them. So after that, after the, the, the boys and uh, Gigi Tresan, my father, Victor, he called all the cops, uh, and there's five of them, and then Gigi came back. Okay, there's uh, the, the LGBTQ liaison lady, uh, there's, there's strong cop, there's baby face cop, uh, there's my father, um, who else, and there's Gigi. Yeah, three plus him. Okay, and they all came in, and they brought the cold with them on their jackets because they came from the outside. And then they tried. They were going to kill me. Why even bother taking me to West Virginia? They're going to kill me right there. So I punched them up. I ended up punching up the uh, my father and the uh, and babyface cop. And they're all they're like women. You can't touch a cop. They they act like oh you you hit a cop. You know you're under arrest. And then I punched them up some more. So. I survived that. 
Well, the next morning, I'm taking deer hunting, okay? There's no escape. There's no escape. Three people are going to die that weekend. Three people will be murdered in front of me just that weekend. Uh, and they, they put the dog outside, so I couldn't, you know, jump out the window. Uh, inside was my mother and my father. I, I had to get past them, and there was no way I could get past them. And they kept me naked and starving. No food, no water for 24 hours. So my father took me deer hunting, and this was the last year, maybe in all of West Virginia, but definitely in Morgan County, West Virginia, where you were allowed to drive the deer, where it was legal to drive the deer. And so we, we posted up in an L formation. There were guys strung out uh, about 10 feet apart, eight, 10 feet apart, uh, to shoot at the deer as they would go past. And you see this in Apocalypto, they drive, they're driving the pig and the pig runs into the trap. That's kind of how it was. So I was one of the drivers because I'm young and spry, even though I hadn't eaten. So we met up at a, at a restaurant where my father starved me and beat me and raped me in front of everybody. N didn't even let me take a single bite of anything. Didn't let me drink anything. Didn't let me eat anything. I'm going on pretty long. I'm starting to fall asleep on my feet because that's what happens when you don't eat anything. You, the, the moment you stop moving, you just fall asleep. You just shut down like a computer with no battery. Uh, so anyway, he, he's standing there uh, with his 30 odd six bullpup handmade rifle. So he made this gun himself out of just some wood and some steel. And the way that he ingratiated himself with the cops was he uh, was a gunsmith. And that's how he ended up getting his badge. So the first shot hits a tree four inches to my right. And it's a 30 odd six. That's a killing weapon. That's what, I believe that's what they use in the military. Okay, you drop a man and you kill him with one shot. So it hit the tree and the splinter came out and it cut my face, big splinter, like, like three inches long. Another shot hit at my feet, a third shot went slightly left. And he made no secret that he was trying to shoot me. So there was a young man standing right next to him and he called the game warden. He called 911 and the game warden came. He was wearing his green uniform, but he didn't arrest my father because my father was a Montgomery County police officer. My father was always pulling his badge. Okay, this is the only man who was courageous enough to call the police at the scene, okay? 10 more people called him in after, after we left their presence, 10 more people, uh, and the people from the restaurant. So at least 10, maybe 15 people called on my father for abusing me, trying to shoot me, uh, starving me. So anyway, this young man, he tracked us to the 49 acres, the farm property, to check on me. And at that moment, and he snuck up on us, and he had his rifle and everything, and he was still dressed for deer hunting, my father was forcing me at that moment to skin a deer that was on a hook and still twitching and hanging, you know, bl blood dripping and uh, hanging from a hook, and it was still twitching, and it seemed to still be alive to me, uh, which really troubled me. But anyway, he was telling me, at that moment, he was telling me that he was going to hang me on that hook and skin me just like that deer when the young man crept, on, crept up on us. So my father, he just... After just like 10 seconds of talking to him, he, he pulled his gun and shot him right in the, in the belly, which all of his later victims, he shot him in the stomach, gut shot. He then stripped him naked in the snow, okay, hogtied him, and handcuffed him and hogtied him, and then put him in the trunk of our car, alive, in the freezing cold. Then he called his Berkeley Springs cop friend. I call this guy Boss Hog because he was really fat, okay, to enjoy the kill with him. My father, and I want you to understand, my father never murdered alone. It was a celebration. There was music, there was vodka, there was dancing, and there were friends. And he would prolong the murder and the torture as long as he possibly could. And so he would always get as many of his friends around him as he could while they were raping and murdering this guy. And he wanted to make sure that every single person present involved themselves physically in the rape or the torture or the murder itself. Why? Because then they wouldn't talk. In West Virginia, he didn't have a gang yet. This is actually the day where he formed his gang. Only Boss Hogg, the big fat Berkeley Springs cop, you know, and to become uh, a Berkeley Springs cop, apparently you needed to graduate 
third grade or something. Okay, they were the the standards were lower, and the standards were higher for like the state cops and the county cops. So this guy, he was just, you know, he was boss hog. Uh, so he was the only guy in my father's gang at this point. And the Montgomery County cop, strong cop, female cop, LGBTQ cop, Gigi Treson, who was not yet a cop, she was my age. I was like 12 years old or maybe 14 years old. So she was 12 or 14 years old. She's the same age as me. Okay, the Montgomery County cops, it was too far to drive. And my father, since he ran this gang, he, he required every person in the gang and anybody in the gang, it was only cops, and anybody who was not a cop was not in the gang. And that actually turns out to be important. And that's why the Tanner was killed, okay, because he was not a cop, because they didn't have to protect him. All the cops in the gang were made guys, made men, made women. You couldn't touch them. No matter what happened, no matter what they did, no matter who caught them, they're not, nothing's going to happen to them. They're going to kill anybody. They're going to write any false report. They're going to do anything. And I think there's a lot of cops like this, and this is a problem. Most of the Montgomery County cops, they complained that it was too far to drive 90 miles each way uh, to come to all the murders. And so they stopped being required to come to all the murders. And only, only uh, Boss Hog in West Virginia had to show up at this point for the murders. So Victor and Boss Hog we all go to the Tanner's house. And the plan is, uh, we're gonna, they're gonna rape and kill me at the Tanner's house. And the Tanner is a new friend of my father. He thinks he's the right kind of person to participate in these murders. So as soon as we arrive at the Tanner's house, my father, Victor, he pops open the trunk and proudly shows the Tanner the naked, shot, hog-tied, deer-hunting young man. And the, the Tanner, he pokes him with uh, the barrel of his of his gun, and he says, oh crap, he's alive. Well, of course he's alive, Victor says. Please let me have my clothes. I'm freezing to death, please let me go. I won't tell anyone, the young deer hunter said. Shut your mouth, Victor threatened him with the knife, and then proceeded to stomp his face eight or 10 times until the blood flowed, you know, while the man was naked and tied in the trunk, and he kept moving his head to try to avoid the stomp, but he got stomped up pretty good with the heel of his boot until he was bleeding real bad. Please, the man was now bleeding from his head. I need a blanket or something, I'm freezing to death. Victor, finally, he pulls a crusty blanket from the car, and I'm not sure what was done with this blanket, but it was crusty. And he lovingly goes and he tucks it, he tucks the man in, you know, and speaks very whispers very close in his ear and molests him, you know, between his legs while he's doing it. Please let me go. I won't tell anybody, the young deer hunter man begged. I told you to shut up. Victor punched him viciously in the face and then took his knife and plunged it into the man's side, causing him to scream in agony and terror. Just kill me, just kill me, stop torturing me. We are killing you. Victor was like ice. So we're gonna kill him? The tanner let out some enthusiastic yips. No. We're going to kill him. Victor pointed his bloody knife at me. Boss Hogg put his nut head down and smiled and licked his lips like a lion. I'll kill him, but you have to let me go, the deer hunting young man said. You want me to kill your boy? Sure, why not? Well, if I kill your boy, I reckon you're gonna kill me. I can't kill your boy, you do it. And the tanner handed my father back the bloody knife. So as the three were discussing murdering me, a car crested the hill and then slowed to a full stop. And it's like a roller coaster, okay? Those hills right there at that spot, they didn't flatten them out or anything. That's just the way the land is. It was up and down and up and down like a roller coaster. So they stopped at the top of the hill right there by the Tanner's house. And the Tanner's house is on another rise. And the man, there's a man and a woman inside and they looked, they were just gawking at the three men and me and the three men were standing over the open trunk. I don't think they could see into the trunk with, you know, the naked man inside. And so I started, I ran toward the car and I screamed, help, help, uh, they're gonna kill me. There's a man in the trunk, they're killing him, help. And then I tried to get in the car, but the man pulled a gun and he actually tried to shoot me, which kind of freaked me out. The couple, they looked right at me. 
they looked very alarmed and then they sped away down the winding road as fast as you can go on a road that's like a roller coaster. It's like almost one lane. It was like one and a half lanes. I, I think it was paved at that point. I don't know. It wasn't even paved at that point. It was, at that point, it was still rock and gravel. Okay, so a moment later, Boss Hogg says he's listening on his radio because he's in full uniform. They called it in. Why you little Victor advanced on me with his knife and gun. The dog, my dog, circled behind me to prevent my escape. He was growling with his hackles up. You know, an 85, 90 pound dog with his hackles up for a small boy, that's pretty scary, even for a full grown man. And he lunged at me twice. He was snarled and he would hit me with his big chest, but he wasn't biting yet because he wasn't told to bite me. Yet. So I spun and I punched the dog four, five, six times on his snout with my fist and then I kicked him in the mouth uh, with my foot, with my foot. Don't hurt my dog. Victor pointed his pistol and fired, but it went right, and it almost hit the dog. Stop, Boss Hogg said. The supervisor's on his way. I called myself in as the responding officer, so I wasn't here, I just arrived on the scene. You need to get this guy out of here now and take the kid too. I don't know if I can save, you better save me. If I go down, you go down, I'll tell him everything. This was Victor's common threat, and he always threatened this, and he had his hand on his gun. Are you threatening me? Yeah, I am. I'll shoot your ass right now. Boss Hogg pulled his gun and moved his gigantic fat body behind the trunk for cover. So about 4% of him was covered because he was so fat. How are you going to explain the guy in the trunk? Victor asked. You put him in there. His blood is all over your car. I caught you. You shot at me and I had to return fire. Boss Hogg says, I'll tell everything. Not if you're dead. Okay, okay, calm down. We're in this together. I'll take the car with him and the boy. Let's go. Come here, Joseph. They sprang into action, trying to wrangle me into the car. My father came after me with a gun in one hand and a knife in the other. The dog snarled at me, baring his teeth, but kept a respectful distance because I kicked him in the face. Get in the car, boy, Hogg screamed. Shoot him, the tanner screamed. All three pointed their guns at me and fired. Boss Hogg and Victor missed. How bad do you suck, man? Five feet away. I'll hit you five feet away for sure. The dog yelped in terror and ran for cover. The tanner's gun didn't fire, and he muttered, cheap reloads. Berkeley Springs supervisor cop screamed up with his lights and sirens blaring. He jumped out of his car with his pistol in his hand. Drop your weapons or I'll shoot you. Drop it now. Instantly, Boss Hogg was a cop and suddenly on the side of the supervisor. He retreated for cover further behind his cruiser. I'm not dropping nothing. I'm a cop. Ask him. Victor casually puffed his cigar with his gun and his knife on his belt. The tanner put his gun on the ground and raised his hands. Get on the ground, now! Victor, supervisor cop, shot a warning shot over Victor's head. You don't see that anymore, they just shoot him. Okay, okay, you got me. Victor laughed and put his hands up, but he didn't move. On the ground, on the ground! Hogg echoed. I'm with you, I'm a cop. Tell him, Victor looked at looked at Boss Hawk. I don't care. Get on the ground now or I'm gonna shoot you. Come over here, boy. I'll protect you. I looked behind me to run, but the dog was stalking and snarling behind me, so I didn't move. We have a dozen reports of you abusing this boy, starving him, and trying to shoot him in front of witnesses. We even have two reports of you actually raping him. Did you rape this boy? I was disciplining my son. I'm his father. A state police car pulled up with his lights on. The officer jumped out with his gun and used his car door as cover. Help, help, the young hunter kicked the locked trunk lid. Get me out of here. You're part of this? The Berkeley Springs supervisor cop looked at Boss Hogg in disbelief, who hung his head and big tears ran down his cheeks like a big fat baby. And he swung his head side to side as if to say, no, no, no. Yeah, he shot the guy and put him in the trunk. Victor was finally in handcuffs. Boss Hogg looked at Victor, his face hardened. He drew his gun, pressed it directly to Victor's chest and pulled the trigger to shoot him in the heart. Gun didn't fire. Victor let out a barking laugh. Supervisor lunged and grabbed Boss Hogg's gun out of his hand, then put Boss Hogg in handcuffs. You're going down with me. Victor glared into Hogg's eyes, nearly nose to nose. I mean, he advanced. I have a family. Hogg reverted to script. I have a family, Victor retorted. 
You mean him? <laughs> Hog snorted his head at me derisively. Get me out of this trunk. I need an ambulance. I've been shot and stabbed multiple times. I need, I think my arm is broken, Deer Hunter insisted. What are we doing here? State police officer looked at the Berkeley Springs cop, the Berkeley supervisor cop, and then looked at the, the guy tied up, hog tied in the trunk. Because they didn't take the guy who was hog tied in the trunk out of the trunk. And you'll see this a lot. They leave him in handcuffs for a long, long time. Be afraid. Be very afraid. They decided to call the two witnesses back to the scene. They were a married couple, a poor married couple that lived down the street, and they had a bunch of kids. Everybody that lived on that road, down that road, was poor, okay? Because it's a dirt road. And then after they paved it, uh, the neighborhood got wealthier. They told them they needed to take their statements at the scene. When they got there, they were both shot in the stomach immediately. They were handcuffed and then taken behind the back of the Tanner's house where he skinned the animals and dried the hide, hides. The Berkeley Springs supervisor cop said, I was never here, and he fled the scene as fast as he could. I was left in the custody of the state police officer. He looked like Dudley Do-Right. He was young, strong, stood up straight. He looked like a cop, like the kind of cops you see on TV. This state officer held me at gunpoint for most of the time until he got tired of holding his gun, with the dog snarling behind me, keeping me hemmed in. He tried to put me, I tried to run away a couple of times when the screams got too loud. Uh, so he tried to put me in handcuffs, but my wrists were too small and I slipped right out. He explained that he wasn't permitted to put a minor in cuffs, but apparently murdering innocent people was no problem. And he tried to shoot me once or twice. Uh, the tanner displayed his skills by skinning the man alive while he was handcuffed. The screams were jarring and terrifying. Okay, each time I made a run for it, the dog tackled me and put his teeth on my neck and looking at the state cop for the kill signal. But the dog didn't know the state cop. This is the first time he ever saw him. So there were multiple bite marks on my neck on both sides by the end of this. Uh, and he broke the skin three, four times, four to six times. You know, there's two sets of canines and I needed rabies and tetanus shots. I didn't receive either. And within a short time, I'm not, I don't remember how long it was because I was very young and I'm very old now. Uh, my, I almost got locked jaw. My jaw almost completely locked. I woke up one morning and I, my jaw was cracking and I could barely move it because the disease, the lock jaw had progressed to the point that I had full on lock jaw and then I got over it. So I literally received no medical care. Okay, I was like a science experiment. And my mother and my father asked me constantly about my symptoms and my sufferings. And they gleefully, you know, speculated on when I would die. Uh, so finally, because I tried to escape so many times, the cop, he took my shoes and my pants so that I wouldn't run away. What a great cop. Anyway, this guy joined the gang. So from this point on, because my father was so impressed with the Tanner skinning skills, my father then skinned at least partially or completely all of his victims from this point on while they were alive. He would skin them while they were alive. Okay, this is like the ultimate satanic practice. If you look into these satanic practices, they'll skin the face off the victim and then wear the victim's face and look at the victim and it drives them insane. That's one of the things the Satanists love to do. And that's something my father would do. I didn't see the Berkeley supervisor participate in any of the crime scenes after that. This, this state cop became a gang member, and he was present and active at every murder, kidnapping and torture I witnessed in West Virginia. And as I said before, all gang members were required to be present for all events that occurred in West Virginia, all West Virginia gang members, and they had to be in uniform. All Montgomery County police gang members were required to be present for all kidnappings and crimes and murders, any events occurring in Montgomery County. And there was a lot of crossover rape, torture, live burial was very festive and not to be missed. And later they had huge murder orgies, okay, where they invited Hollywood Illuminati. Uh, Shem Steinberg, Shem Satanberg, I like to call him, uh, his adopted black daughter who uh, just launched her porn career. I don't know if that's going to go anywhere. Uh, I did look up her video. Ugh, I couldn't watch it. But anyway, the the Hollywood Illuminati were coming and they were, they were snatching multiple victims. But this is 
This is in the later years when my stepbrother took over, and I believe most of the victims were being sourced in uh, Fairfax, Virginia, where my stepbrother was a cop and may still be a cop. I don't know. A sheriff, a sheriff's deputy. So the tanner, he became an associate. He couldn't be a full gang member because he was not a police officer. Despite his criminal record, he insisted that he wanted to be a cop right along with them as soon as he found out about it. And they seriously discussed it. They discussed expunging his record, trying to try to figure it out. But his record was too extensive. He had too many things on his record. So right away, when the tanner realized that every cop in West Virginia was behind him, he went on a killing spree. Okay. The, the couple that, they, that he murdered and was buried in his backyard under some animals, uh, they had a whole bunch of kids. Some of them were in college, some of them were younger, and suddenly they don't have a mom and a dad. Some of them came looking for him, and he, I think he wiped out the entire family. There was like nine kids or 11 kids. Crazy. You notice something like that. You know, a family of 13 disappears. I think he wiped out the entire family line, and then he started killing some of the relatives. And this happened in a very short period of time, like four or five weeks. He buried some on his property, mixed in with the dead animal carcasses, because no one wanted to go near his house, because man, the stench was, it's the stench of death. And, you know, multiply that times 10, 20 animals, you know, that are dead carcasses, and it's pretty, it's pretty ripe, and nobody wants to go over there. So they didn't want to drive past his house. And people, I think, you know, people would even complain about driving past his house because it stank so bad. So finally, Victor and Boss Hog paid him a visit a month or so later. And so they confronted him at gunpoint. And, of course, the tanner said, if I go down, you go down. Because the guy, he was a pretty bright guy. Uh, you know, he might not have much schooling, you know. I don't think he passed the sixth grade, but he was, he was a sharp guy. It don't work that way for you. You're not a cop. Victor held his head down like a coiled spring with his hand on his gun. I have to arrest you. Boss Hogg held out the handcuffs and smiled disarmingly. Why is it you? How do I know you're going to arrest me? The tanner squinted his eyes suspiciously at Hogg and Victor and the large, vicious dog. You don't. Victor gave himself away. There was a struggle and they shot the tanner to death at his house. So either they reported killing the tanner as resisting arrest, you know, and my father would have left the scene, or the tanner was publicized as the local, as the murderer of the, of the whole family and maybe even as a local serial killer. Now, he was also seen burying bodies on our property Okay, because our property, the 49 acres, which they just, which, which two FBI agents just fake searched, is right over the hill from his house. Okay, our property's right there. And he was seen burying, you know, transporting and burying victims on our property because he killed so many people in such a short time. But before the tanner went, before he was killed, he made a cape and a loincloth of the human skins of the man and the woman, the two witnesses who witnessed the crime that day. I finally saw my father wear his satanic outfit one Christmas Eve. He invited me and my entire family for dinner. So my entire family's involved. Before we could sit down to eat, he appeared wearing the loincloth and the cape and only his glocks. So a cape and loincloth of tanned human skin and twin glocks and a knife in a shoulder holster. And that's it. I was to be the sacrifice that night. I ended up making it out because if you're ever confronted by bad people, always fight back, okay? How many people survived my father and brother and the murderers trying to take them? Only one. I'm the only one. Why? Because I fight. You have to fight. Uh, always fight. Never submit to anything. Just fight. And if there's a dog there, and there was always a dog there, yo, you know, just, just go for it, man. You got feet. Use those feet. Anyway, so I made it out, but my stepmother, she intervened on my behalf and says, no, 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 you can't shoot him. You're, he's your son. I love him. And so she was shot in the stomach, and she ended up in my stepbrother's dungeon. I want you to think about this. My stepbrother, my brother, he put his own mother in a dungeon, chained her up in, in a dungeon, and starved her, and she was raped every day. 
And I don't know if he participated in the rape, but my father would come over and rape her every day. And they have a son. And I don't know if the son raped his own. I mean, this is biblical. The son raping his own grandmother. Oh, my gosh. I mean, just, oh. Dig up the bodies. Dig up the bodies. Do it. If you protect these people, you are these people. Dig up the bodies.